Uh, yeah. If you promise to stay there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right, let's get started. Did I everything right? Have I broken something? I always think I've broken something. Hey everyone, welcome to Open Space for a Monday, uh, September 16th, 2019. Uh, this week I've got a special guest. Uh, I had no idea I was going to have a special guest and then I just reached out to him 12 minutes ago and he said, sure. He's in the middle of a, an astronomy experiment, so he's got exactly <laughs> one hour before he has to head back out and continue the next stage of the, uh, of the, <laughs> of the experiment. Uh, my guest today is... Uh, Dylan O'Donnell from Australia. Dylan, how's it going? Hello. Yeah, very good, Fraser. How are you going? Good. I don't even know what that gibberish means. How am I going? How are you going? Uh, that's fine. Everyone makes fun of my accent, so uh, it's, only, it's only fair. No one will be able to understand a word we're saying in yeah. America. Yeah, oot and a boot. <laughs> um, so for anyone who doesn't know, uh, Dylan, of course, is a fantastic astrophotographer, one of my favorites working in the field. He's got an amazing observatory bolted on to his house using uh, one of the nicest telescopes, actually the same kind of telescope that I get to use. <laughs> um, but except his, you know, is within uh, hugging distance, which is always convenient for your telescope. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, and he also works on a whole bunch of other really cool projects. So if you want to learn about uh, space astronomy and mostly like how to do astrophotography and how to take on a lot of these projects on your own, I highly recommend Dylan as well as his uh, thoughts on an unfeeling universe and our inevitable demise. That's right. I think a lot of astronomers have that nihilistic worldview, so I'm, I'm quite comfortable in this, uh, in this yeah. company. Well, we always used to say on Astronomy Cast that the universe is trying to kill you. <laughs> yeah, I, I always found it funny how um, there is the argument from uh, religious people that the universe is tuned for life and tuned for us some, somehow. And uh, when you start learning about it, you look around and go, actually, the universe seems pretty well tuned for death. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is the minimum viable universe for life. It, you know, <laughs> it's like the there could it couldn't be any worse. It could be worse. But, yeah. you know, it really wasn't trying very hard to get any better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, mostly it's uh, it's the worst. And, of course, I was able to to visit Dylan about a year ago uh, in Byron Bay. I was able to do a talk at your cool Star Stuff conference. Uh, is there going to be yeah. another one of these? There is going to be a third one. And that um, it, this is unofficial news, uh, exclusive release on uh, right. Space. Um, the date will be July the 18th, 2020. Uh, and of course, this is all organized around the, the moon phase. So we have to make sure that we have a, a dark sky for yeah. us, uh, stargazing in Byron Bay. So just uh, keep tabs on me and you'll find out all about star stuff in Byron Bay, Australia. Oh, fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to give uh, people a chance if they want to ask some questions. Uh, I mean, you can ask... Uh, Dylan, anything, but uh, but specifically, uh, like I said, if you are in any way interested in getting into astronomy, buying a telescope, getting into astrophotography, as well as any projects on that, um, Dylan's your guy. Uh, so Dylan, can you let people know uh, sort of what you do on your channel? Sure. So um, the backyard observatory you were describing before is actually the easternmost observatory in Australia. I'm on the very edge. It's like the end of the earth. And uh, that means that there is literally no light pollution in one direction. Um, and that has allowed me, I did have to um, turn off a street light by removing its fuse manually <laughs> at my own risk. Uh, but that has allowed me to uh, basically really um, dive deeply into astrophotography. I just walked into a shop, bought a telescope and went down the rabbit hole. And um, I'm, I'm really just lucky to be in a, in a good spot for that. So uh, ultimately I'm, very much in the pretty picture zone like i make pretty pictures i've got my youtube channel where i share how to make those pretty pictures um but anyone who's done that or gone through that process knows that um you you feel like a bit of an explorer you start seeing stuff and you start wanting to understand how these nebulas work or, or why the colors are different here or how a globular cluster works all that sort of thing um, so I very quickly went down the rabbit hole and now I'm doing my astronomy degree, which will be uh, finished soon. I assume when I finish my astronomy degree, I have to 
stop saying amateur astronomer and start saying real astronomer. astronomer. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I've been very lucky. I've been able to travel the world and go talk about uh, astronomy. I was at Needs in New York, and uh, shortly I'll be going to Uluru, the, uh, the dead center of Australia, which is going to be the darkest sky I've ever been to, uh, which should be amazing. And I will be documenting that trip as well. So I'll share that with all of you guys too. Um, so for people who want to get into this hobby, what, you know, I'm sure you get this all the time. And so I love to get people's suggestions on what's their favorite telescope to start with. If you were going to get started in astronomy, sorry, amateur astronomy, um, <laughs> what telescope would you start with? Uh, I wouldn't start with a telescope. I'd start with a camera um, because the easiest form of astronomy or astrophotography you can do is that wide field Milky Way stuff. And you don't need any special mounts. You don't need tracking. You just need a DSLR camera uh, to be able to take a long enough exposure to, to capture the Milky Way. And you can reveal a whole lot of stuff just in an image like that that your eyes aren't normally seeing anyway. You can, especially down here, we get a lot of the dark nebula patches throughout the Milky Way. Um, you can reveal that dense Milky Way core around um, Sag, our black hole. And that's a really good place to start exploring. Um, from there, you can obviously step up to binoculars, which is the easiest thing again. Uh, and then if you were starting with telescopes, then you start getting into this whole debate. And it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a minefield, really. Yes, uh, it is. Any astronomer, <laughs> what the, the best first telescope is, and you will get a myriad of different answers. Um, so it really depends on what you want to do. I personally like the schmidt cassegrains and Celestron uh, provide a massive and great range of schmidt cassegrains And I've also been impressed with the RASA telescopes as well. So they're F2 yeah. high-speed telescopes. And uh, so I'm using those to, to knock over targets in like a couple of hours instead of several nights. You know, people yeah. will spend a month building up enough data to put an image together. Uh, and now if I put together one or two nights of data from RASA, I get a really deep, massively deep exposure that you wouldn't have expected from uh, an amateur astronomer. Um, so I'm really impressed with those particular kinds of scopes at the moment. Uh, but of course, other astronomers prefer refractors um, and, and they're their classic um, Galileo style telescopes. Um, but they, those telescopes have limits. And that's why those are uh, all the biggest observatories in the world. You know, there comes a certain point with those telescopes where the, the, the weight is just untenable. You can't create a bigger refractor. So reflectors really are the name of the game. And that's how we can use uh, uh, a series of mirrors, an array of mirrors, and create a, a big uh, curve to, to make a huge observatory work. So you'll find all the, the massive observatories are some version of a reflector telescope like the schmidt cassegrain right. that use. I, I think... My opinion used to be sort of on that same path you were about uh, the, about the Schmidt Cassegrain. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of lazy about my astronomy and I really want to let a computer find my objects in the night sky. But I, we did a, we had to get together um, for our 500th episode of Astronomy Cast and there was sort of an impromptu star party and a bunch of people brought their homemade Dobsonian telescopes. And I just fell in love again with the Dobsonian. Mm. And so for a while there, I had been providing this advice. You get like a relatively inexpensive go-to telescope and then and then decide if when, once you hit that path about are you going to go down the astrophotography route. And I was even saying like go with binoculars. And binoculars are, are wonderful, but also binoculars are cheap. Like like binoculars, you just you spend $30 and you can get a pair of binoculars that'll, that'll give you a really good time with the night sky. Mm. And I'm really coming around now to say, go for a Dobsonian eight inches at the most, because here's the dirty secret of astronomy, of, of amateur astronomy, is that really there are only three things to look at. There's the moon, there's Jupiter, and there's Saturn. You're going to spend 95% of your time looking at those, those three things. And you can look at them from anywhere. And if you look at them in a light bucket Dobsonian, they're mind bending. You, your friends come over to visit and you show them the moon and, and their jaws drop and they can't believe it. You show them Saturn and it's, it's a transcendent experience for them, right? They're, they can't <laughs> believe what they're seeing with their own eyes. Yeah. But, and then there's a couple of other things that are okay. You know, the ring nebula, the globular clusters, but everything else is just different kinds of fuzzy blur. 
Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and so it is a very disappointing prospect to go any farther with any of them. And if if you get a really fancy go to Schmidt cast grain, if you get a, a really large telescope, you're going to be really disappointed. It's when you shift over to astrophotography that then everything opens wide open again, and you've got this whole brand new field with thousands of objects. Mm-hmm. Each one has its own nuances and, I, and so i i i've now yeah. shifted my my position to dubs yeah and i think people definitely get addicted to, to the big dobs you know they call it aperture fever and, and there's a there's a there's a word for dob users which is dob snobs because they become addicted to their dobs and they just can't let go and yeah. they are impressive devices right as you said visually they're they're hugely capable they let a lot of light in um but you're correct. And this is why I like the Schmidt Cassegrains because ultimately people want to see the planets, right? And if you have a Schmidt Cassegrain, you're packing a lot of focal length into a pretty diminutive little telescope. So it's something that you can use as an all rounder. So for, um, especially for astrophotography, a Schmidt Cassegrain will get you the nebulas. It will get you the globes. It will get you deep into um, the planets as well. So I like that all rounder aspect of it. And the other thing to, to also mention is that a dog is massive. So it becomes um, unwieldy to just take out whenever you feel like it. And uh, again, I think the SCTs are more of an all rounder in that sense. And especially if you're starting out, you do want an all rounder scope. You want to be able to try different things. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, that's why I like the SCTs. But right. like I said, it's a, it's a minefield. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It is, of course. And, and I mean, I'm obviously, you know, there's nothing like a, I mean, people, like the, the shorter, the stubby telescopes with the, the eyepiece out the back that sort of points up, that's your, your Schmidt cast grain. And, and I agree, but I, but I feel like you're going to, like I said, you're going to see those three objects. You're going to see a couple of, of globular clusters. You're going to look at the Orion Nebula and you're going to go, meh. You're going to look at... <laughs> you, do, you do have to manage expectations, yeah. I find, especially at outreach. Um, people have seen the photos. They've seen the... Uh, you know, amateurs are doing stuff that looks like a Hubble photo yeah. these days. And then they look through the eyepiece and they can't see colour. Um, you know, the, the, the cones in their eyes just can't make out the colour at that low light level. Um, so it's really disappointing for them. Uh, I try and guide the experience if I have someone looking through a telescope just to start asking them, especially if they're looking at, uh, for example, a planet, I'll say, can you make out the great red spot? Can you make out the equatorial bands? Can you see the gap in the Cassini division? Or can you see the shadow on the edge? And once they start thinking about what exactly they can pull out of their their eye view, um, that definitely helps the experience uh, a lot more. But it is managing expectations um, and people can be thoroughly disappointed. You go into a, a shop, and you buy a telescope and the box has this big photo of Saturn on it. <laughs> and then they get it home and it's a tiny little, yeah. little microscopic view. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's one that we should uh, manage. But also our eyes are pathetic. They're, our yeah. eyes evolved underwater as, as fish eyes, right? And now we want to look to far greater time scales and i think we should pass over to cameras Cam- cameras just do a far better yeah, job yeah yeah no our, our no, meat cameras to, are no good never put a, uh, an eyepiece on my um telescopes ever again <laughs> so so then let's talk about what you can see from the southern hemisphere because i suspect most of the viewers are very familiar with the kinds of things we see in the north the, you know the big dipper mm. uh cassiopeia a lot of yeah. these things these are mysteries to you what do you see and <laughs> yeah, and how is our how is your sky different from ours yeah this has been a learning experience uh, for me as well and talking to um other people in the northern hemisphere and seeing their photos and seeing uh, a lot of objects that you guys can get that that i can't get some i can sort of get like andromeda just comes up over the horizon uh, but nothing like what you guys see i believe that the northern hemisphere has more of a range of galaxies uh, to view. And we've got some big ones too, but um, you guys just generally have a better galaxy season than we do. Um, I think we have much better view of that central core of the Milky Way though. It comes up like yeah. right, right over my head. Uh, so we can get in deep to the M8 Lagoon Nebula and all, all the, the nebulas around the um, Sag and Scorpio region. Um, but 
we have a lot of dark nebulas as well. So we have one called Corona Australis, uh, which is literally named after the country I live in, which I think is wonderful. Um, and that is, it, it's a beautiful dark nebula. So you can see all of this dark dust lanes through through the nebula. And I, I really like those ones. And, and they were something that I was completely unfamiliar with when I went into this. It, you're used to seeing Orion and the hydrogen emissions with that big, beautiful um, pink glow. Uh, but then when you start doing these deep exposures, you notice all the, the black everywhere and these voids where the stars disappear because they're obscured by the dark dust lanes. So we've got massive ones that stretch over the, the whole sky and we have the, the, these real, real pop features like the Doodad Nebula and um, Corona Australis and uh, Carina is full of um, dark dust lanes as well. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, the Southern Hemisphere is known for its dark nebula, uh, but we have the big ones as well. And we have a, a range of really weird galaxies. Um, you know, we've got the Small Magellanic Cloud, the Large Magellanic Cloud, which are naked eye galaxies, uh, but we also have... Um, uh, Centaurus A, which is just so bizarre. I, I look at it and I, I can't even see where it fits into the, the, the tuning fork diagram or any kind of um, categorization because it just looks so strange. And I think um, part of the reason it looks so strange is because it's close, because we're seeing it closer than we w normally would in the other galaxy. And if we were further away, we'd just see it as a fuzzy blob and go, oh, that's a, that's a cool looking fuzzy blob galaxy. But um, because we see it so close, we can we can see these jets mm -hmm. and infrared, and it's just super weird. Yeah, um, I mean, again, like one of the treats in addition to coming and and hanging out and and doing the talk was you guys did a, a live observing session and I was able to come out and actually see the Southern skies and see a lot of these objects that I just, you know, the large and small Magellanic cloud. Um, and of course the Omega cluster, you know, I'm, I'm a gigantic fan of globular clusters and that is the king of all globular clusters. And it's, it was stunning. It was wonderful too. Cause I was like walking around and everyone's like, Fraser, Fraser, we've got the Omega Centauri <laughs> Omega cluster in our telescopes. Like I just got to go and tour every single telescope, all of them simultaneously turned yeah. to the Omega. But, but I got a chance to do some astrophotography in the desert or when, actually not the desert, but we went north from where you are and mm. up the, the east coast of Australia. And again, I've never seen nights. Like I live in a place that is pretty good for night skies. I don't have a lot of light pollution. I get to see the Milky Way and it's just next level. So uh, I, uh, mm. and as you said, that, that idea of the core of the Milky Way, which normally is this, for us, it's this thing just down on the horizon. It makes this, it peaks <laughs> up in, in the summer and then it goes back down again and it's gone and we've got to wait another year. But for you guys, it just goes right overhead. And yeah, which is, no. you know, and to be able to see objects like that's, that's the only place you really want to have to look is directly overhead. And that's where the, the sky is the clearest. And so you just get the best objects, all that stuff at the core of the Milky Way, the pillars yeah, of creation. In, right? in that Australia and America are sort of roughly similar size. Um, but how many, how many people live in America? It's like, I don't know, 300,000, 300 million or something. 300 million, something like that. Yeah. We've got, I think 20 million, something yeah. like that. So when you look at the light pollution graphs, you see these little spots around Australia where the, the capital cities are, but everywhere else is just inky black. And so it doesn't take long as, as you found out, you can just drive north a little way and suddenly the skies just go dark. And uh, the star party that I go to up here, which is the Queensland Astro Fest, uh, we got to experience a Portal 1 sky, which is, you know, it's, it's as good as it gets. And when you're out there, even even seasoned astrophotographers and astronomers like ourselves, uh, it, it's, it is a very, um, very visceral experience to be under such an amazing sky. It, it can, when your eyes adjust, it's, the Milky Way is literally... Uh, casting shadows and you can make out your surroundings because that's how bright it is. Yeah. So it's something that I would like to connect more people with in general. I think that especially in the modern world, we can grow up and never, ever see that. And so unless you seek it out or, or make a point of going somewhere dark enough, uh, you look at the light pollution maps in Europe, uh, you know, the yeah. place is blanketed. Yeah, there's with, no with place light. they can go. Yeah, ironically, if you look at um, the uh, you know ISS flyover of um, Korea, you see that North Korea is is switched off. Right. You know? 
Um, dear leader has figured out that if he turns off the lights at night, he'll save a lot of money for his impoverished nation. But uh, it, it is a bit progressive to think we could be just turning off the lights at night. We don't need them. Most of us are asleep. Uh, I, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I like uh, I like that idea. Well, uh, you know, Kim Jong-un has really sort of figured out the future of astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's hard to use him as an example, but I, yeah. I have, um, you, you might have heard the town that I live in, Byron Bay, uh, has recently passed a motion to um, reduce street lighting. So the, the mayor has seen what uh, is happening with the Star Stuff Festival and um, this concept of low impact astrotourism. And, and uh, it is coming around to the idea that this could not only be good for the town environmentally, but it's going to save a whole lot of money. I think London is already uh, doing things like this. There are parts of the world who, which are just turning off the lights at night and saving a whole packet of money. Um, question from the audience. Grant Lanning is asking, how does the weather favor viewing in Australia? How's your weather? Uh, so I live in the subtropics, so it can be very wet sometimes. Uh, when it rains, it really rains, and then it just clears up. Uh, I'm lucky enough that it is uh, warm enough and north enough here that I get um, a lot of viewing time. But again, you, it, if you're in a subtropical area, you, you want to um, pick those nights when they happen because you might not see them again for another month or two months. Uh, and that's where the, the raster and my high-speed imaging really helps. Uh, that said, you get into the middle uh, where Uluru is and the, the central deserts. Uh, it's like like your deserts up that way as, as well. They just become very dry and very clear. And that's, of, of course, why they build uh, observatories out there. Um, so our observatories are in, inland in, in regional areas and, and they're pretty dry. I mean, we're in, we're in the middle of a drought right now. It hasn't rained for, <laughs> for months. Uh, and we, the farmers are up in arms. I'm, I'm loving it. I'm an astronomer. I, <laughs> right. the drought is sort of a silver lining for me. Um, but yeah, the, the way things are going, we're not going to get a lot, a lot of rain for a while. So that's pretty good. Have you, have you thought about, uh, or have you been tempted to set up remotely in one of those deserts? Are you, do you kind of like having the telescope handy nearby? Yeah. So I've never been big on remote telescope stuff. I sort of, um, played with it a little, especially in the early days when I couldn't afford to build my own observatory and I wanted to try these big scopes. There is something um, more satisfying with having your own observatory and doing it yourself, but I'm not a purist in that sense, especially for science. It really doesn't matter whether it's your scope or, or someone else's. Um, I, I'd liken it to fishing, right? When you go fishing, uh, you is it is it about catching the fish or is it about just sitting there on the jetty and enjoying the experience of, of fishing? And uh, ultimately, I... I like the fish. I like to catch a fish. I like to eat the fish. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's how I approach astronomy. I, I, I want the results at the end of the day. Uh, but I do I do like the process of, um, you know, t tinkering in, in, in the backyard with my telescope. Uh, that That's my man cave, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've had a chance to use the exact same telescope that, that you use. I think I have a different camera. Thanks to Oceanside Photo and Telescope, they've set up a, a RASA 11-inch with a full-color camera. And mm -hmm. for you, you're, you know, you're looking to sort of boil down what would be several nights of observing into a couple, you know, several one night. I'm trying mm -hmm. to do things in five minutes, in three minutes, <laughs> because because that's yeah. the attention um, for the uh, for the virtual star parties. Uh, and do you find that you have to increase the gain or no. is there any kind of live stacking or anything like that? No, I, I haven't gotten that fancy about it. Um, I probably should like to do like a live stacking. And, you know, I think this is I would love to have some conversations with you afterwards where we can figure out some technical solutions because you mm -hmm. sort of like you know, several years ago, we did these virtual star parties. And then because of the difficulty in trying to be able to arrange everybody all at the same time, everybody to have clear skies, everybody's gear to work. It was, it was just too tough. And we had to shut the, them down. Um, you then followed in my footsteps, did the same thing and, re party, yeah. <laughs> and reached the same conclusion, right? Yep. It's, it's difficult. It's like herding cats, really. Yeah. Um, but I do think that the live stacking concept is something that we'll see more of over time. Um, we're seeing it now with the Uni Telescope, I believe. Yep. Um, there's the Stellina a, does it as well. 
So yeah, yeah. yeah. So every ten uh, seconds you get a new image and it's a little better. And you just say, you know, you just keep watching it until you decide to bail. Right. Yeah. So you're just like, this is <laughs> pretty right. great. It's not getting any better. I'm out. Yeah, exactly. And and the return on investment for stacking is is about thirty to forty frames. So once you've got thirty to forty and they're all stacked together, they average out all of that noise, you get the kind of clearest shot that you're going to get. And then it's just a decision about whether you make those exposures longer. So you're stacking, you know, one second exposures or 10 second exposures or one minute exposures uh, to get the deeper kind yeah. of view of that nebula or galaxy. Um, but as cameras get more sensitive, uh, this is going to become uh, less of an issue. The cameras are becoming really quite noise free now. Uh, ZWO cameras are pretty spectacular, the CMOS cameras, which are the same chips that are being used in smartphones. And I believe um, even Google is going to release a smartphone in the next little while that has an astrophotography mode. So they are going to be marketing the fact that you can take a photo of the Milky Way. I, I think you still need a tripod or something to, uh, to keep it steady, uh, but it would be great to see a phone that can actually reveal the Milky Way in uh, significant detail. That'd be interesting to have someone do a live mode, a live stacking mode. I've got the Pixel 3a and mm -hmm. it's got a night mode that's pretty impressive. Like I was mm -hmm. able to take some pictures of the telescope that I was using and I was able to get the, um, uh, I was able to get the, the big dipper in the background and you could easily mm -hmm. make it out. And it's just with my phone camera. So we're, I think we're kind of getting yeah. there if we can use that, <clears throat> that, that technique. Um, yeah, a lot of the improvements that are happening now are software improvements. If you see with the new iPhone release um, or, or what's being built into the Pixel or even um, DSLR cameras, when you're doing noise removal, the camera is actually taking a separate image after. So you take a 10 second image, then it takes another 10 second image as a dark frame and uses that as dark frame removal. Um, live stacking is part of that. So once the software is sort of baked in so that it will can can take several and then stack them together uh, that's something that we already have the technology to do it just has to be rolled into the, the driver basically yeah um now you are uh going to try and make that transition to uh, to become an actual astronomer <laughs> yeah I'm, so i'm at university uh right now doing my um it's the equivalent of a bachelor degree in astronomy uh it's pretty interesting we've done um all the sort of physics um, stuff so far. And now I'm doing a, a unit on history of astronomy, uh, which is why I'm running out every hour because I'm, I'm making a giant sundial in my street. Uh, there's a, a big street lamp and every hour I'm just marking off the shadow of that street lamp. Uh, and so I'm getting in touch with my ancient astronomy ancestors to try and uh, figure out the east-west inclination and see if I can polar align my telescope based on an ancient uh, technique, uh, which would be fun. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm making that transition as I think many people do when they get into the subject of space and they go a little bit further and, and some of us go down the academic hole. I'm not sure if I'm going to turn that into anything like a PhD or anything like that. I'm, I'm quite happy to uh, just keep making pretty pictures and, and basically be a, a space tourist. I like the idea of um, traveling the world and visiting astronomical sites and dark sky sites. It's such a a rich field that we're in you know you you understand space in general as a topic is just so large and yeah. you can specialize in any one area there's so much there's the rocket launches there's space exploration there's the deep space stuff satellites it's just there's so much to it so at the moment i'm just enjoying that journey yeah um <clears throat> someone is mentioning uh the new interstellar comet uh c 2009 q4 is it visible in your skies have you taken a crack at it yet i haven't checked yet because i i heard that the close approach is in december i think it's going to be 1.3 au or something like that well, uh, away from us that's not bad <laughs> yeah it was closer it's still a bit away out yeah so I'm waiting for the close approach so I can figure out if it's visible then to get the best possible image. We are seeing images coming through already, but it is exciting to, to get an interstellar style um, comet coming through and, and so closely after Oumuamua as well. Yeah. Um, really interesting object. And when you're taking photos of comets, um, color is important. If you've got a one shot color camera, um, it's, it's great to get the, the more detail with the mono cameras, but when you have the one shot color, you can really reveal the green or the blue 
of the cometary tail and that can give you more information about the makeup of that comet and, and, and how it's composed. So I think as it gets closer, taking colour images of this, um, this particular comet will be particularly important. I believe a Muumuu, they detected signatures of, um, was it iron or, or metals? It had a reddish, in it, some sort of oxide. Um, oh, I don't know. So it'd be interesting if this one is going to be a red one or a green one. Um, I got a question that came from Larry Beckham in the chat, and I, this is a good question. Can different people at different locations do stacking together? So, you know, right. I mean, not necessarily interferometry. Like I know people are thinking like you could take two telescopes and you could combine their light and build a baseline from the distance of the two telescopes and and that yeah. only unless you can align them to the individual photon wave front, <laughs> uh, you know, 500 it's, nanometers. Yeah, but I, I, I understand the question though, because it's yeah. something I've thought about a lot um, when I started getting out in photography as well. The, the concept that we could all just all take images all around the world at the same time of the same object and then stack them together. And in theory, yes, you would be able to get that signal to noise ratio right down and you could probably get a very interesting picture. In reality, um, the, there's a few distortions happening. There's the distortion of the optical tube itself, which will produce coma in the field where the stars get a bit pointy on the edges. Um, there, that's going to mismatch between between the images so some sort of distortion correction needs to happen and and programs like fix inside will do that distortion correction um, but that's not the only distortion there is parallax if you're taking uh photos from two ends of the earth there will be a minor shift in parallax and that if there's enough of that that's enough to make stacked images of of one uh, star field make all the stars look blurry and, and weird and there is the atmospheric distortion. So depending on whether you're looking at an object straight up or whether it's on the horizon, the image will literally bend. Um, so I think in practice, if you tried to do that, it would be an interesting experiment, but I don't think the result would be a clearer picture. I think it would be a fairly distorted picture, actually. But you will often work with other astrophotographers, take their data and then do your processing on their on their data. That's right. So if you've got um, two, um, and, and usually it's someone who is relatively close to me, like I might work with my friend John in Sydney, and he'll do the HA and then I'll grab the data and we can merge them together. The distortion is going to be minimal or minimal enough that Pix Insight can sort of fudge it in. Or if the corners get too weird, you can sort of just crop it out, which is the astrophotographer's dirty secret. We do a lot of cropping on the edges. Um, but yeah, it is, it is useful to collaborate with other astrophotographers in that sense, especially when you're doing multiple channels and someone just has a better setup than, than you for say hydrogen alpha, or you're better with the color, then you can work together. Um, the other thing, the other distortion to be aware of though, is with the two different telescope setups, you'll have different sampling, um, your camera and your telescope together have uh, an ideal sampling ratio. Sometimes you can be out or on different ends of the spectrum of that um, sampling ratio. So that's another distortion that doesn't work so well. So it, ideally to get the clearest image possible, you want to do all of those channels yourself with your own gyroscope. But it is, it's just a nice thing to do to collaborate with other people. And I have collaborated on images with other people with, with great results. Yeah. Uh, for those of us who you know, maybe aren't taking astrophotos, but are seeing a lot of them on the web. How can we appreciate the picture better? How can we sort of judge? I mean, obviously, you know, it's art, you like what you like. And, but, <laughs> but I mean, I think that there is some, you know, there's, there's contests every, every year for the best yeah. astrophotography. What makes a good astrophoto? Sure. This is a good question. Um, the first thing that I look for in any astrophoto, especially when it's true color, not a false color image, is look for the difference between the red and the blue stars. If you can differentiate clearly the red and the blue and there's no cast on all of them, sometimes you get an image which is just too red overall or you don't see any blue stars and that's where the color has been pushed too hard in one direction. So I look for a good color balance and that means that the gray that you're looking at in the sky is just gray. It's not tinted green, it's not tinted blue, it's not tinted red. And there's a differentiation between the blue and the red stars. <clears throat> I know um, at the David Malin Awards here in Australia, that's something that David Malin, who basically invented uh, color astrophotography, he, he's really looking for that very neutral color balance that isn't exaggerated one way or the other. Um, so that's something that I look, look for. I know that astrophotographers 
are very critical of their own work and we, we zoom in and we look at how round the stars are and that sort of thing. Um, that's, that's also a good indicator. I, I like to look for images that haven't been too heavily manipulated. And this is perhaps subjective, but um, I made a video about APOD <laughs> awards recently. Yeah, I and, saw that. And talking about how it does seem APOD uh, is biased towards these really heavily saturated images. And I personally don't like that. I just like having a very, um, a very gentle, subtle um, kind of view of the colour because I think that is more natural. Uh, what we expect when we see, even if you're a, a visually looking at a nebula with a with a sensitive enough eyepiece, you would see a, a faint pink glow, like almost like a salmon pink kind of glow, not these blood red nebulas that you sometimes see on on APOD. So that that's my personal uh, way I look at um, astrophotos. Um, but there are some incredible false color ones as well. If you're looking at a narrow band image, a false color image, you're really looking for the details. So you're looking to see how much differentiation you have between the dark clouds and the, the soft wispy areas and, and that level of detail that you can pull out. Um, Beth Johnson asks, what is your response to people who call astrophotos CGI, whether the photo is processed or not? Man, I would love to be working for NASA, even if it was as chief Photoshop um, UFO scrubber. <laughs> Um, I, I, I don't, and I, I'm flattered that people think I actually do get paid <laughs> by NASA right. to, to sit around and create CGI images of space all day. I'm sure my wife would love it too if we were getting that sort of an income. Um, but no, in, in the reality, um, I basically make zero from astrophotography because it, it costs me so much money to, to put everything together. Um, but I think it's funny. It, it's funny in the comments. I kind of, I used to engage, um, but I think I have enough followers on YouTube and stuff that someone leaves a comment like that and everyone else sort of piles on. Uh, so I just let them fight, fight in comments. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think that, like I did a video about this uh, about a year ago and I embraced the fact that pictures are fake that when you're looking at pictures of Saturn taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, or you're looking at pictures from the surface of Mars, um, or even these great pictures that are coming back from Juno, you're looking at, say, four separate filters, mm. three color filters, a UV, oh, sorry, an, an infrared filter, they're all being merged together. And then an artist is choosing which color maps to which filter. And a lot yeah. of, you know, a lot of the photographs, like the stuff from the Hubble Space Telescope, they're using the Hubble palette. And and there are more than 100 different filters on the Hubble Space Telescope that the astronomers can choose for their science. And then somebody after the fact is going to go and say, okay, that's red, that's blue, <laughs> and that's green. And, yeah. and make a picture. And it's... It has value for science obviously but there's an aesthetic romantic quality about yeah. these images that we would otherwise never get to see unless we used yeah. the filters in the first place to get them yeah and there, there are things that are difficult to capture in one shot color um, that we necessarily have to bring out with filters and i don't think there's anything wrong with that i think what the the problem is though is is sort of like the same issue with models on the cover of vogue magazine <laughs> people get annoyed when um the butt has been enhanced or the, 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 all the spots on the skin have been removed. And they, they, the complaint, which is a valid complaint, is that it's not a genuine image. I think the difference with astrophotography is the kind of blemishes we're removing are not, you know, blemishes, pimples on the planet. We're actually removing things like noise and um, cosmic ray strikes and stuff that actually damage the image. Uh, in that sense, I think these images are probably a truer a representation of reality than a Vogue cover shoot. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting just to talk about how it like, I don't really care, you know, and, <laughs> and yeah. so I find it fascinating about the way these things actually work. And, and even the most kind of true to life picture that you take, like, you know, a photo of the Milky Way taken as subtle as you as you want to, to try it's still a long exposure with your, mm. you know, with a camera that's able to collect a lot of photons in a way that your eyeballs just can't do. And so people always talk about this idea of like, boy, you know, they look at these pictures of the Orion Nebula and they go, oh, it'd be so cool if you could be really up close to it, right? Or yeah, standing and in the I, spacecraft I and looking at the window. 
that we are in a nebula, like we have the solar nebula around us and you can see it as zodiacal light um, every now and then. And it's really disappointing to realize that it doesn't look at like the photo of Orion Nebula and you're sitting in there like a little spaceship inside this pink cloud. It's really quite faint. And when you're in it, it's quite distant as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not super worried. Um, so Grant Lanning asks, uh, what's your view on the proposed satellite constellations going up? Yeah, so um, a video I posted about this, um, which was the Elon Musk Starlink SHRT show, um, got more views than, than any of my other videos really quickly. And I think it's because Elon Musk has a fan base <laughs> who, who defend him at all costs. But I was, I was deeply concerned when I saw those uh, first few Starlink satellites go up in the, the train across the sky. Uh, we haven't seen any follow-up to show that it's a major issue yet. But uh, I think they're, they've scheduled several hundred more recently. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for Another launch. 24 launches next year. So that's yeah. times 600. So they're going to do 1,200 uh, oh, at least God. satellites next year. 24 more trains. And that should provide baseline coverage for the, for the United States and, and a lot of places. Yeah. This is an issue for astrophotographers. It's, it's, yeah. it's very concerning. I, ultimately, I'm, I'm just doing pretty pictures, though, so I'm not as concerned as um, someone like the Large Synoptic Sky Survey. The, the guys who are actually spending millions and billions of dollars to generate data with Large Sky Surveys that then have to deal with essentially data loss uh, because they're taking images which are contaminated by um, Starlink or satellite constellations, that's a, that's a really big hit. And so I'm, I'm a little worried for those guys more, more than I am for my yeah. pictures. It is, it is concerning. And there was that issue the other day where um, the ESA satellite had to be moved. And I think, um, what was it the ticketing system was down? On yeah, <laughs> so the, there, was, there was supposed to be an automated system where the Starlink satellites would communicate with ESA and they would, they would warn them and they would make their move, but they uh, couldn't. So for some yeah. reason the communication didn't work and so isa had to move the position of their of their satellite at the last minute although apparently mm -hmm. this is a thing that satellite operators do all the time so it kind of seemed like a way to just um to uh, ignore the request <laughs> yeah yeah well just you know like a way to sort of make a comment about starlink like yeah you know, that the upstart okay. is, is putting gotcha. their satellites in our skies and and we were forced to move when yeah this is going to become a huge issue as more satellite constellations get up and yeah. um each, each provider um then has a responsibility to to spend a certain amount of propellant to to move theirs and and, yeah. and this game of um, um chicken that's happening in space but i mean you have to remove trails from your pictures all the time Constantly, yeah. yeah. Um, Orion and Rosette are in this, um, it sort of crosses where the geostationary satellites are and it just seems to always be hammered with satellites uh, as, as we image it. And different different um, objects will have different numbers of satellites, but it's, it's very, very common for satellites to go through. Um, people sometimes ask me, do you ever see aliens or UFOs in your... Um, images and I say, yeah, I see UFOs basically almost every exposure. They're just zipping through, and uh, if they're really bad, I, I tend to throw away frames, or you can average them out with certain stacking algorithms. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you, you see them everywhere, and uh, I think when you get into astronomy, you don't you start to realize how much stuff is moving. Just even just looking with binoculars, you start to see stars moving around, and then you realize these these aren't stars at all <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 i know it is i mean but it is already a pain like like i think if people are just waking up to this possibility that they're going to have all of this stuff going through their through their huh. telescopes i mean airplanes uh satellites <laughs> clouds you know yeah, yeah. astronomers are, are i think there's something like six thousand active satellites right now that's like the, the grand total of all satellites up in space for all of human history so far and then starlink is proposed twelve thousand yeah, like twelve thousand like, in a decade is that's insane yeah yeah i'm uh i mean a, a lot of people were very concerned that it would it would visually look really annoying but so mm. far it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. Like I think you'll right. go outside in the night sky and you'll see the ones that are, that are newly launched, 
but you won't see the 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 ones that have moved to a higher orbit. And in theory, um, they're planning to reduce the ref the reflectivity of them, so they'll be less uh, yeah, visible. Brilliant. Yeah, but absolutely they are going to be, there's no way you hide it from it going through the field of view of a telescope, like a telescope, a monster telescope that's doing a big long exposure is absolutely going to have these <laughs> lines passing through. And yeah. it just means that the amount of, of data that the astronomers can get, they'll have to image longer to get the same amount of data, or they're going to have to have a, a, a you know, more uncertainty in their in their images. So. Yeah, and and one one thing that I bring up a lot in my talks as well is, uh, especially down in the southern hemisphere here, we have this blind spot where um, the the government or Congress actually funded a survey of the sky to discover all the near Earth objects under um, one kilometer in size. And they've done a pretty good job of cataloging most of those. Uh, their estimates are maybe eighty percent of them, um, maybe ninety percent, but. Um, then they they made the survey uh, tighter, so they said, well, let's let's find them over about 500 meters. So in, any of these would be um, catastrophic if they hit Earth, and certainly wipe out a city quite easily. Um, and we have uh, blind spots for these. There are certain parts of the sky we just can't see because of where we are in orbit and, and the sun and day and night and weather and the southern hemisphere. We uh, we don't have funding down here to contribute very much to those surveys anymore at all. And that creates an opportunity for amateur astronomers uh, like myself to discover things like comets. And I suspect that's why Terry Lovejoy has so many comets under his belt because he's not competing with a uh, formal sky survey. Uh, but now we have Starlink as well, which adds another complication to this idea of trying to catalog all the near Earth objects. And that has consequences. I'm not sure what those consequences are because I, I do wonder if we ever find one hurtling towards us, uh, how fast we could scramble to do anything, or if it would just be nice to know, uh, to give our loved ones a kiss before we all ultimately are destroyed. Right. Yeah, that's, that's really why we want to, I, we were uh, talking about the, uh, in, in last week's astronomy cast, we talked about how these new asteroids, these littler asteroids that astronomers are, are finally getting to, Ryugu and Bennu, are just piles of gravel there. And so every time you hit them with a some kind of impactor, it's it just reforms into a different shape of a pile of gravel. So, yeah. so in <laughs> fact, it turns out that the vast majority of these little asteroids that are buzzing around the solar system, the ones that are most likely to impact us, if we even did discover with any kind of advance notice, we really don't have any technology that would allow us to to deal with it, you you know, you're not going to be able no, to send no. the, the, your nuclear missiles, you're not gonna be able to send a, a plucky team of space miners to go and <laughs> drill into it and put put nuclear bombs inside. You yeah, just... look, I, 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 without making any too political a, a comment, I, I, I see that our leaders struggle with doing simple things. I can't imagine the kind of complexity involved in deflecting an asteroid, uh, nor do I have confidence that they would be able to pull it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not super, uh, uh, super optimistic Confident. yet. Um, <laughs> so what are some cool projects you're, I, you know, I find that with a lot of stuff, you're quite handy uh, with your, the projects that you work on. Uh, what are some ways that people can kind of get their hands dirty and actually do some some astronomy for themselves, some, some projects they can build things like that that you recommend? Sure. Um, so I, I do obviously recommend following me on YouTube because I try and post weekly with new things that I'm doing. Um, it's not all about uh, hardcore observatory projects. It's about image processing, but it's also about building a uh, $5 feather touch focuser uh, using a clothes peg and stuff like that. Uh, projects coming up include a uh, all sky camera, which I hope to build soon. Um, I do have some information coming out about star stuff and the speaker lineup. I do have a, a trip to the dead center of Australia coming up with uh, Dark Sky Traveller. And I am always uh, advocating for the reduction of light pollution. Um, yeah, so there's a lot going on. <laughs> um, so what is a like, what is a project that somebody can, you know, if somebody wants to, you know, maybe with their kids, try to teach them something about the night sky. What are some great educational projects that you recommend that they start with? 
um, get out to a dark sky, dark sky site. Um, the sundial thing is super easy. So um, just just set up a stick in your backyard, and every hour mark the height, the total height of that shadow. And there's an amazing amount of information you can gather from that. It, it is in fact how uh, we originally learned that the world was round. Um, so that's something you can uh, do while your flat earther friends are around at uh, Christmas dinner and uh, see how they can explain it. <laughs> how they can explain the uh, <laughs> the fact stick, that the shadow is different. Stick from gives house. a shadow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Liquid Flames asks, uh, is there an image that you're most proud of or was the hardest to get? Um, so the image that went most viral and the one that gets exhibited a lot is the image of the International Space Station crossing the uh, crossing in between the Earth and the Moon. Um, I processed it as a colour image, so I really pulled out that, that colour of the Moon. And um, that was probably my, my most proudest because Chris Hadfield noticed it, um, NASA noticed it, uh, the world noticed it was on the Weather Channel and on TV and stuff. And that was a really amazing moment in, in my life. Uh, I've since repeated it with several other transits. Um, I have work being exhibited in New York Hudson River Gallery right now for the Lunar Apollo 50th anniversary. And uh, I have an, another image for ESA of their Australian installation with a um, star trail, uh, which is going to be on exhibit permanent exhibit in the West Australian Museum as well. Um, so I'm, I've got a few few images that I'm, I'm proud of, but at any given moment, it's usually the last one I've posted is the one I'm most proud of. <laughs> um, that that whole process, I mean, I think that's an example of a project that people can do because there's some websites that you can go to that'll tell you when the moon, when the space station is going to pass in front of the moon or the sun. Mm -hmm in your neck of the woods and then you can go to the right spot at the right time point your camera at the moon roll video and then look at it after the fact and and there it is uh and yeah you sort um, of i to... personally like um cal sky yeah um, calsky.com it's um it's a really ugly looking website but amazing back end where you can um, see maps of the the transits and and track not just um the International Space Station, but things like the Hubble Space Telescope and and really really weird stuff, even Starman uh, in uh, in his Tesla floating around in orbit. Um, so I, I recommend that one. You can sign up for email alerts. That's really good to have. Um, they used to do iridium flares, but they're sort of disappearing now. Um, yeah, that, Cal Sky is my recommendation for that. Yeah, um, and the the part that it was sort of surprising to me was when I did it or I tried to do it was I was expecting to see the space station pass right in front of the moon as expected, but <laughs> it didn't because the spa the station wasn't in illumination, uh, and yes. so you couldn't yeah. see the station. And then it was in the it was in the picture after the fact, but it's yeah, a, it, it, you know, it's amazing how diverse. Um, space station transits can be. You can get a transit uh, illuminated or not illuminated, so it's a shadow. You can get it at, when the moon's at full phase or half phase or no phase at all or in the daytime, a daytime moon illuminated transit. There's, it's, actually, it's actually quite divert or going across the sun. So even though it's a single kind of uh, astrophoto, every single transit I take is just completely different. So it's something I really enjoy, yeah. I I'm going to get uh, copyright claimed by Nintendo. <laughs> Sorry, every time you hear the Super Mario Brothers theme, it's um, a new subscriber on YouTube. So yeah. if, that's, if that's because of this hangout. Yeah, I know. So there you go. People are watching. They're, they're interested in what you're talking about. They're checking out your channel and then they're subscribing to you. So uh, and unfortunately, what that'll do is that'll take down this whole video. But hopefully we'll, we'll find out. I'll let you know if I get a if I get a, a takedown or a copyright uh, takedown from from a certain uh, uh, video yeah. game company. Um, <laughs> So we've got about just a couple of minutes left and I wanted to sort of for people, if they want to sort of follow what you're doing, uh, where can they go? What can they see what you're doing? Uh, so youtube.com forward slash earth muffin, E R F M U F N, uh, same for Twitter and my Instagram as well, which is just, just do a search for Dylan O'Donnell. You'll, you'll find me there. Um, you can also check out if you are interested in coming down to Australia and seeing a beautiful dark sky, event but also meeting a bunch of scientists and um, astronomers and having a fancy dinner as well which uh, Fraser can attest to um, do check out the Star Stuff Festival in Byron Bay for 2020. It's a sellout event every year 
and you'll find that information about that on my YouTube channel as well. We have a, it's, a, it's basically a party, yeah, yeah. Uh, and just a star party in the traditional sense. Uh, we, we drink a lot and we talk space. <laughs> I was too busy talking to be able to enjoy the dinner. Um, <laughs> yeah, true. You were the keynote speaker. So. Yeah. That was your your moment. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, right. that took that distracted me. So I wanted to give you um, a five minute. I wanted to let you go now because I know you've got to go and do the next step of your science project. So um, my sundial, yeah, my yeah. giant sundial. I do have to head off. Yeah, I'm well, exactly. So you've got your, you got your five press. minutes, uh, Dylan. Uh, if people haven't already. Uh, since we've already clearly uh, copyright struck this video, go ahead to his channel, subscribe. I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, uh, and I believe in, in your immortal words, uh, what do you say at the end of every video? And remember, everything is meaningless and we're all going to, to die. <laughs> all right. Well, on that note, thanks, Dylan. Tip. It was great to have you. And uh, I'll talk to you after. I got, I got cool ideas for some projects. I want to work on with you. So. That sounds great. Thanks, Fraser. All right, take care, man. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, before we get into uh, the end of the show, apologies, we didn't have time for questions, many questions, um, but uh, we've got some interesting guests coming up in the next couple of weeks that I thought you should know. I kind of accidentally uh, spoiler alerted one of them. So next week, we've got... Uh, uh, Professor uh, David Kipping from Columbia. He is a ExoMoon researcher. He runs the Cool Worlds channel here on YouTube. And of course, he's going to be the one who is going to talk about the Halo Drive and the Terrascope. Not the Terror Scope, but the Terrascope, turning the atmosphere of planet Earth into a giant telescope. So he'll be here next week. And then the week after that, we're going to have uh, Professor Sean Carroll the uh, of uh, of quantum uh, mechanics fame. So he's going to be talking, obviously, about the uh, many worlds inter interpretation of quantum mechanics. So we'll be having that chat. So uh, as always, if there are guests who you want me to bring on here on these live chats, please let me know. I uh, would love to to hear them. Uh, just drop me an email, post in the comments, and uh, and I will see what I can do to try and bring some of these people on board. The next thing that's happening this week, of course, is the Weekly Space Hangout. We're back with uh, new episodes, with an, with an all-new mixed-up cast. So come and join us. That's on Wednesday afternoon at uh, 5 p.m., same time as this. Uh, our new video on the channel drops tomorrow, and that's going to be all about building a base on Phobos and Deimos as opposed to trying to land humans on Mars right away. So definitely uh, check that out. And, of course, QA100 happens this week. And I have absolutely nothing special planned, except a special guest answer from uh, uh, Anton Petrov from uh, What the Math. So uh, thanks, everybody, for joining me this week. Uh, if you haven't already, definitely go and check out Dylan's channel. I think you're really going to enjoy it. He is, he is one of my favorite creators on YouTube. I'm a huge fan, and, uh, and he's a great friend. And uh, so I think you'll really enjoy the rest, all the work that he does. His videos are short, very entertaining. And if you're interested in astronomy, especially getting more into amateur astronomy yourself, he's one of the best people that you can follow. So definitely check it out. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks to the moderators. Uh, thanks, everyone watching. Thanks, of course, Dylan. Uh, we will see all of you at various times tomorrow, Wednesday, Friday for Astronomy Cast, and next Monday with uh, Professor David Kipping. All right. We'll see you all later. Now I have to figure out how to turn this off again.